There we go. Okay. All right. So um, once again, welcome uh, to everybody here to our final installation of the um, the webinar uh, series on uh, projects with the Geo Amazon Web Service uh, Earth Observation Cloud Credits Program. Um, we've been uh, looking at all of the um, projects over the past few days, and so we now come to your final five projects today, which are focused on uh, sustainable development. Um, so we're going to be hearing from um, Costa Rica, from Rafael uh, Mon Monge Vargas uh, on um, the Global model Modeling Tool for Nature's Contributions to People in Sustainable Development. Then we'll hear from um, Kenneth Aidu in uh, Ghana, who's going to talk to us about capacity, to build, capacity development and monitoring of the SDGs. Then we'll hear from um, Krishna Balakrishnan from India on the uh, India Data Cube. Uh, next, we'll hear from Earth Observations for Sustainable Development Project from Mexico, Colombia. And then last, we'll hear on methodology for SDGs indicator assessment by Natalia Kusul from the Ukraine. So um, I'll just start sharing my screen here with uh, to get things started uh, to kind of explain how things are going to work. So um, <clears throat> what we do is we will uh, hang on just a second. Let me change a few things here. So what we're going to do is we're going to have just a few minutes on an introduction and uh, we'll hear from um, Anna and Joe at Amazon. They'll give us a few words. I'll say a few words about GEO and then we'll launch right into the project presentations themselves. We have videos from all uh, five projects. So we'll listen to the video first and then we'll have a few minutes of um, <clears throat> of live uh, question and answer with uh, the project leads who are online. And then uh, we'll spend the rest of the time uh, in an open discussion uh, on some of the, perhaps some of the uh, difficulties you've encountered and then anything else that uh, you'd be interested in, in discussing. So um, maybe at this point, I'll turn it over to Joe and or Anna for a few opening remarks uh, from Amazon. Yeah, I can I can go first and then Anna throw it over to you. Um, so uh, um, for those of you who have been here the previous days, uh, I mean, same thing uh, that I've sort of been saying previously for those of you who are new, um, just super excited to see see all the, the videos and get to talk to you. Um, as Doug sort of mentioned, this is the way that 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 we sort of get updates. So I'm, I'm eager to see what you all are doing. Um, I know most of you because uh, I've been handling some of the, the credits, uh, but, but if I haven't spoken to you, I'm, I'm Joe Flasher. I'm the open data lead uh, at AWS. And so I'm very interested to see how you're using the data, what data you're using. I'm also equally as interested if there's data that uh, you want to be using that isn't available in the cloud. Um, so I'm sort of listening for that. Um, I'm also listening to see if there's common things that are blocking you across different projects. Um, that, uh, that we can sort of help unblock you uh, with there to, to make you most successful. Um, so I won't sort of talk too long. Uh, I'll sort of throw it over to Anna, but just very excited to, to see what you all are doing. Um, and I'm also, I think we'll all be monitoring the chat. So uh, there are question and answer periods. Anna and I will have another period towards the end to talk as well. Um, but if you have any questions for us, please, um, please just put them in the chat uh, and we'll sort of be watching that as well. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Anna Pinedo Privet, and I am with the sustainability team at Amazon. I also lead the Amazon Sustainability Data Initiative. Um, and uh, for those that are not familiar with it, it's a tech for good program. We're trying to figure out how to uh, leverage Amazon's technology and infrastructure, and in particular, the cloud. Um, to really promote more innovation in terms of sustainability development and uh, problem solving. Um, leveraging those resources. So um, as Joe mentioned, we, um, we're really eager to understand better uh, the work you are doing and any roadblocks that you might be facing in your work, uh, because really the mission um, that we have with ASTI is to try to understand how to remove those roadblocks. So it helps us a lot to engage with 
uh, the real users in the community to understand what those struggles are and to the extent possible to help. Um, so thank you for making the time to share your work. Um, and I look forward to, to learning more about that. Thank you. Great. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Joe. Thanks, Anna. Um, so um, just a few words about GEO. Um, I know some of you are, are quite familiar with GEO. Some of you are perhaps less, less so. Uh, so just uh, to let you know what GEO is about, it's a, it's a global partnership of governments and organizations that uh, are looking to inform decisions and actions uh, with Earth observations and uh, providing those Earth observations in a coordinated, comprehensive, and sustained way. GEO has been in existence uh, since 2005, and uh, we have over 110 um, member governments that participate now, and uh, we also have organizations uh, that participate, many uh, UN organizations such as UNEP or the World Meteorological Organization, WMO, as well as uh, research uh, and other Earth observation-oriented um, institutes. Um, this program is a, a, a kind of uh, a test bed, if you will, uh, between GEO and uh, Amazon. This is the first time that we have embarked on a program where uh, Amazon is providing cloud credits for uh, projects, in particular projects that are from uh, developing countries and are looking to support global policy, major policy um, endeavors, such as the Sendai Framework for Disaster Risk Reduction, uh, the Paris Agreement, and uh, the UN Sustainable Development Goals. So this uh, particular um, series of projects we're going to look at today are most um, closely aligned with support for the uh, UN SDGs. And uh, in the broader context here, this is, uh, again, this is our first uh, trial of uh, bringing Earth observation data and uh, analysis platform that AWS can offer uh, to uh, you for free. And um, so we're anxious to see how you're making use of those credits. And uh, we'll see that in just a moment. Um, before we get started, just a few ground rules. Um, as uh, Joe mentioned, if you have a question at any time, uh, please feel free to put it in the chat window. We're, we're all taking uh, a look at that from time to time and we'll pick up on any comments or questions you put in. And um, also, I suggest that you turn off your webcams while we're looking at the presentations themselves, uh, just because uh, bandwidth issues sometimes can get uh, kind of tricky. Um, but then when we come to the Q&A sessions, if you want to switch your webcam back on, that would be, uh, that would be fine. And um, then lastly, uh, we've all done quite a few of these teleconferences, so I think it's kind of second nature by now, but please remember to mute yourself, mute your microphone when you're not speaking, just so that we can keep uh, background noise to a minimum. Okay, um, with that being said, let's go ahead and start with the first um, project. Um, I would just like to uh, introduce you to Rafael Monge from uh, Costa Rica. He is the lead in a project that's called a global modeling tool for nature's contributions to people in sustainable development. He is at the Ministry of Environment and Energy of Costa Rica. Also, he is the director at the National Center for Geo Environmental Information. So uh, with that being said, let's uh, go right to the presentation. Hello, and thank you for the invitation to participate in the GEO AWS EO Cloud Credits webinar series. My name is Rafael Monge, and I work in the Ministry of Environment and Energy of Costa Rica as director of the National Center of Geo Environmental Information. In this presentation, I'll be speaking about the project, a global modeling tool for nature's contributions to people in sustainable development. This project is made possible through a collaboration between Stanford University's Natural Capital Project and Costa Rica's Ministry of Environment and Energy, the Central Bank of Costa Rica, and PRIAS Laboratory, and work funded by NASA and the Group of Earth Observations, 
and supported by the GEO and AWS Cloud Credits Program. Rapid improvements in spatial data, computation, and visualization present new opportunities for ecosystem service modeling, especially in terms of its integration with Earth observations from satellite remote sensing. Air observations can provide near real-time information of the current states of ecosystems at global extents, but cannot necessarily predict benefits provided to people or how these may change under different, different management or other drivers. Ecosystem services models are designed to do exactly that, but there are often hindered by lack of data at the appropriate spatial or temporal or temporal resolution. Earth observations can help fill these gaps. Scaling up and integrating air observation in ecosystem services modeling can provide more relevant, accurate, and readily available information for decision. There are a growing number of opportunities for such science to inform investments in nature to support human well being around the world. This project is aiming to advance the use of satellite information to predict patterns of biodiversity at different level, levels, providing more continuous coverage across both time and space of biodiversity than is possible through data collection on the ground, increasing the understanding of the relationship between biodiversity and ecosystem functions and services. We want to advance the science and support decisions making within the government of Costa Rica related to biodiversity and ecosystem services. The key areas where natural capital information could improve decision-making with major policy or finance implications is the development of the first national ecosystem service accounts through the UN system of environmental and economic accounting. The Central Bank of Costa Rica is currently piloting three ecosystem service accounts crop production, carbon, and tourism. Additionally, MINAE, the Minister of Environment, is undertaking a variety of analysis to enhance the reporting mechanisms related to the sustainable development goals, improve biodiversity and ecosystem services, monitoring plans for the Convention on Biodiversity and the Red Plus National Strategy, uh, tackle deforestation and forest degradation, generate key environmental indicators and maps to report to the citizenship on the state of the environment of Costa Rica and map essential life support areas. Our first project goal has been to develop and test models to use Earth observations of ecosystem level essential biodiversity variables or EBVs to predict biodiversity patterns and at ecosystem and species level. Our second goal is to develop and test models to use EVVs to predict ecosystem services, including pollination, tourism, and sediment retention. For pollination, we are assessing pollinator availability and coffee pollination utilizing species distribution models for pollinators and ecosystem functional types uh, of biodiversity to indicate floral and nesting resources. For tourism, we are integrating biodiversity with social media data to develop a spatial model to predict visitation rates from different ecosystem types and bird diversity derived from our species distribution models. And for sediment retention or soil erosion control, we are parameterizing 
soil erosion modeling through the integration of remotely sensitive vegetation indices as part of natural hazard planning to assess climate risks and assess values of habitat mitigating risk. Our main challenge this year has been changing timelines and expectations due to COVID. We experienced delays in obtaining the data needed to validate each of our models. We also had planned to have an October big virtual workshop last year in person. And like so many other events, had to switch to virtual. This allowed us to extend our reach and include audiences outside Costa Rica. However, in-person knowledge exchanges are always more, difficult, uh, more effective for hands-on technical work like uh, we are performing. And we remain hopeful we will be able to hold a training event in Costa Rica at the end of the project. Integration with a big number of institutions, the volume of data and the lack of prior standards for harmonization of current information are important challenges for the management and visualization of data. There is not enough qualified staff in the institutions of Costa Rica, and this requires better governance and management capacities, especially in key areas like IT. Another important challenge is to design and adapt the end products for the easier and faster interpretation of decision makers and the stakeholders of the Costa Rican and global society. And in this year of the project, we'll be focusing on finishing validation. Sorry, finishing validation and publishing and developing software tools for our partners to continue generating these products after this grant has ended. Specific, specifically, we are planning to deliver pollination field data and validation of EDD-based pollination, manuscripts submitted for uh, species distribution modeling, ecosystem functional type mapping, EVI-based sediment retention modeling, EVV-based tourism modeling, EVV-based pollination modeling, and a synthesis comparison of essential biodiversity variables and land use land cover approaches in an scenario context. Also generalized software tools or scripts for generating EVVs from observations data and for modeling ecosystem services from essential biodiversity variables. Integration of the project results in Costa Rica's reporting mechanisms to international initiatives and to respond to local challenges is also a key area of work for us this year, including the development of the second report of the state of the environment of Costa Rica, which we're hoping to publish by the end of this year or the beginning of the next. Thank you very much for your attention. Okay, thanks very much, Rafael, for uh, that, that great presentation. Um, so do we have um, any questions for uh, Rafael? Let's see, there is one question here in the chat from um, Michael Schmidt. Good morning. Could you elaborate a bit, Rafael, on the ecosystem function modeling? Um, what uh, variables are you using for that? Are you there, Rafael? Sorry, thank you for, for the question. I'm just trying to look at my, my notes because um, there are, uh, it, it depends on the models that we're talking about because we have the pollinators, the tourism, and the Water, uh, sedimentation models, and the first uh, the, the project started by identifying the essential biodiversity variables that we can map uh, with air observations, and that we can also uh, address with other key um, data sources. For instance, for tourism, uh, the, we are using the 
information about, I won't look at the notes, sorry, do this. Oh my. Uh, information from uh, uh, global data platforms where you can uh, put the uh, location of the birds that you have uh, from eBird that you have uh, where you can find information about where are these uh, sites of birds located and combine it with other data from local um, uh, tourism uh, data that we have available and also combine it with information that we have from our observations, for instance, um, a tree cover or biodiversities, uh, different variables that are, are, are possible to identify with this. In our, in our um, a project uh, report, uh, we have a more detailed explanation about it. I'll be happy to share it with you if, in case you want, you may, uh, be interested on that. And we also have uh, these presentations that we share on October uh, available online in YouTube. Uh, and they are very much in, on detailed explanation for each of these three uh, models produced about this uh, information that you're asking. Sorry, thank you. Um, Michael, you have a follow-up question. Do you want to just go ahead and, and ask it? Sure. Um, I'm specifically interested in that product you showed on, showed on slide three. It was a product in the upper row and it showed ecosystem fun function types and it was coded in numbers. Where did you get that product from and how did you do it? But we can uh, move that also to a, a bilateral chat. We're quite interested in it because we tried to do something similar in Mexico. We have a product we call ecological integrity and it's based basically on discerning ecosystems in three uh, main parameters, taxonomic diversity, structural diversity, and uh, functional diversity. And the functional diversity you take mostly from MODIS input data and Lancet. But I, I, I was quite surprised and really impressed that you had so many function types this year. Looks really splendid. Uh, thank you for the question. Actually, I would like to uh, uh, also uh, ask my colleagues from the project to, to elaborate on this. Um, um, my role is more on the management side, and I really no <laughs> learning a lot from this uh, work. But yeah, I, I understand the, your question, and, and I'm very sure who can help us with that. Uh, we, I'll be happy to follow up. With you. Thanks a lot. Great, thanks. Uh, are there any other questions for uh, Rafael? I was just thinking, uh, and I think we, we actually chatted about this last, uh, when we were in Canberra, Raphael, but um, there are obvious links with the work that you're doing and uh, several geo uh, activities such as the uh, ecosystem for, sorry, Earth Observations for Ecosystem Accounting uh, Initiative and, um, and of course, geo bond. So um, we can, um, you know, as, as your work progresses, uh, we should make sure that, that uh, those, there are linkages there that, that uh, can benefit both ways. Yeah, that's something that I've been, uh, we're been thinking, I've been thinking a lot because there are so many things going on in the same time and so many, uh, uh, just 24 hours on the day to work on them. Yeah. And there's a lot of connections with the work that we're doing with the other work that we have with the programs with GEO, uh, but also we want to, uh, uh, and this, the, the usage of the EVVs, the EVs approach uh, is something very, um, um, cut, it, it, we're trying to use these cutting edge concepts and science in order to prove it in our country and also to, well, test it and also be able to replicate it in other, uh, in other sites. This is one specific uh, goal from our project that I think uh, that it will be important for the geo bond and all the geo uh, process. I we would just like to to understand how we can uh, create and add more value on this. And uh, yeah, no, that's uh, that's absolutely right. Um, you know, your your focus now is on the on the project, and then I'm just thinking, you know, down down the line once you. Uh, you feel that you've you've uh, you've got a handle on on how the thing uh, is is working. Then then we can look to go uh, a little bit you know broader in terms of uh, geo activities. 
Okay, um, let's go ahead and um, move on with, oh, I see we have a comment here. Uh, oh, Steve Ramage says he's been in touch with UN Biodiversity Labs who are working in Costa Rica and uh, as well as uh, EO for uh, Earth, uh, for ecosystem accounting and geobond. So good, we'll, we'll, um, we're, we're just keeping an eye on it for now. And then once, uh, once you've uh, matured somewhat in the project, then we can look at uh, making more horizontal connections. Um, Great. Okay. So um, if I would like to move on to our next project. Is Kenneth um, Aido, Aido, are you online from Ghana? Yes, I'm here. Okay, great. Uh, I didn't see I didn't see you come in. I see Kobina as your name. So I yes, wasn't yeah. sure who that was. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Then um, let's um, let's go ahead and uh, have a look at um, at your project. Um, so I'm going to introduce to you now um, Kenneth um, Aidu, uh, who is from the uh, Ghana Space Science and Technology Institute. Um, his uh, particular project is looking at uh, building Earth observation applications in monitoring and evaluating the country's development in the area of agriculture and water resource management in support of the SDGs. So um, without uh, further ado, let's uh, go ahead and watch your presentation, Kenneth. Whoops. Yeah. Hello, I'm Kenneth Bingu from Ghana Space Science and Technology Institute. Uh, our project is to use Amazon Web Service Platform to build capacity on monitoring of sustainable development goals using Earth observation data. Program statements. There are a lot of skill gap in the use of Earth observation data in monitoring and evaluation of the country's development towards achievement of the sustainable development goals of the United Nations. The proposed solution are one, to enhance the skills of participants in the use of Earth observation data in monitoring and evaluating the country's development. And also to introduce participants to Earth observation data on Amazon Web Service platform as an enhanced tool for monitoring and assessing sustainable development goals targets. Uh, the project status as of now is one, our account has been credited, accredited with the necessary amount. So we've been able to install um, RGIS and on AWS platform and as you can see here, we've been able to install um, RGIS Enterprise 10.5 on AWGS platform. And everything is fine. The challenges we have as of now is with the license for the RGIS that we installed on the AWGS platform. And then with the help of um, the coordinators from the project, we've been able to talk to the vendors who they promised to get in touch with the local representative so that they could get us uh, the license that we need. But unfortunately, uh, we've not been able to get it and we are still pushing. Hopefully we'll, we'll get and so, so that our project which has been, it, um, which has been been start for some time now, we'll be able to activate the license and then we'll proceed from there. What is expected to be done by the end of this year is one, we should be able to have the license that we need so that we can activate the IGIS software on the AWGS platform. And also to train the participants in monitoring and evaluating sustainable development goals targets in the area of agriculture and water resources management as a I have already emphasized earlier on. 
and what um, the expected impact that this project will have after completion is one, to be able to build the capacity of participants to handle free new special data, analyze and interpret on AWS platform. And also to enhance the monitoring of targets set for selected United Nations development tools in the area of agriculture and um, water resources management. So these are a few of the highlights from our project that we like to share with you. And we hope with your experience and suggestions, we'll be able to get the license that we need for us to be able to activate and proceed with this project. Thank you very much for your time. Bye-bye. Okay, thanks very much, uh, Kenneth, for that uh, presentation. Um, let's see, I see Joe has got his hand raised, so Joe? Yeah, thank you, Kenneth, for that. So I, I know that you're having problems with the, the ESRI license, um, but I was wondering, is there, um, it sounds like you're still working on sort of figuring that out and you think that that will happen. But in the meantime, uh, could you potentially use something like QGIS, uh, which is an open source alternative for some of the features of, uh, of the Esri products, not all of them, but um, have you looked at using anything uh, open source like QGIS? Yeah, I, um, I hope to use it. Okay, uh, yeah, I tried converting, one, um, converting some of the processes that would have done in uh, ArcGIS onto QGIS, and as at now, I'm still working on to finish one complete um, 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 course session. Then if by end of this month, nothing is heard from them, then we could switch to the QGIS, uh, uh, using the QGIS. Yes, so I've been working on it. Cool, okay, great. Great, thanks. Uh, any uh, other questions for Kenneth? I had one, um, Kenneth, you said that you're supporting uh, principally the um, SDGs related to agriculture and, uh, and water. Are you looking at specific indicators under those, each of those uh, SDGs? Uh, because um, the way that, um, you know, the way that each of the indicators are, are written, some of them are more applicable or more amenable to earth observations than others. So have you have you got to the point where you've decided on which of the particular indicators you're going to focus on? But um, maybe I should. The indicators, yes, I've settled on a few of them, but broadly, what we are trying to do with agriculture is to be able to monitor the conversion of um, basically um, farms that are being converted into mining, illegal mining. There seems to be a boom in some of the places, um, mining um, places in Ghana, conversion of especially the uh, cash crops, cocoa into uh, mining. So we're trying to see um, the rate at which the farms have been converted. That's one. And then in the uh, agriculture as well, we're also trying to see how this, um, 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 the farms are being switched from, um, let's say, cash crops to different crops also in those kind of uh, those localities as well, the mining localities as well. And in the area of um, water management, we're trying to use, um, we're working on the water budget and also again with the mining issue, the pollution of most of the major rivers in Ghana. So we're trying to see the turbidity and other, um, the rate at which um, the major major rivers in Ghana in those um, mining catchment area are being polluted. Yeah, so um, the main drive is using the indicators that goes with the mining and the conversion of land into mining as well. Yeah. So it's, uh, and so we are working on um, uh, with um, SDG Goal 15. It has a lot of indicators going into the area of mining and the conversion of land into mining and its sustainability as well. Yeah, thank you. Okay, great, thank you very much.
Okay, um, if there are no further questions, um, then let's move ahead to um, the next project. So <clears throat> we'll be taking a look at the project um, from a team in um, uh, India at the Indian Institute for Human Settlements. Uh, Krishna Balakrishnan is the principal investigator who is using a, a data cube approach to um, make use of statistical and machine learning techniques to integrate data from earth observations uh, along with census and other sample surveys to generate land cover maps, as well as pop population distribution maps and uh, other indicator data sets at sufficient spatial and temporal resolution. So uh, there are quite a few uh, individuals who are helping out with this. We have Amrut uh, Kiran also, who is the Open Data Cube lead on this project. Uh, Krishna Kumar is the computer vision and machine learning specialist in the project. And then we have uh, Pratyush Tripathi, who is the geo information uh, specialist in the project. So uh, we're, uh, Oh, and sorry, we have Suraj uh, Ravindran, who is also uh, a statistical modeling specialist, uh, who is uh, also supporting the project. So um, let's uh, go ahead and listen to their presentation. Hello, everyone. We are from the Indian Institute for Human Settlements, Bangalore, and our project is titled India Data Cube. My name is Krishna, and I'll introduce the project, and then my colleagues, Amrut, Krishna Kumar, Pratyush, and Suraj will talk about specific components of the project. Our project focuses on the specific problem of lack of data at sufficient uh, temporal and spatial resolution to track development indicators. In the case of India, we do have census and sample surveys, but these are insufficient in terms of temporal and spatial resolution. Moreover, the, these databases exist currently in separate silos, and the differences in resolution makes integrated analysis far very difficult. Several advances in the domain of remote sensing and management of large-scale Earth observation data, this provides us with an opportunity to integrate Earth observation data with censuses and sample surveys. We have proposed to use statistical and machine learning techniques to conduct integrated analysis of all these data sets and generate development indicators which are suffi of sufficient spatial and temporal resolution. Our project consists of four work packages. And now Amrit will talk about work package zero. In work package zero, we're using the open data cube framework to populate two type of data sets. One is the satellite imagery from the AWS uh, open data archive, and the other is from the census and the sample survey uh, data sets that will be raster. In the first part of the uh, framework, we see that we build a satellite data framework from the AWS PDS, the public data archive, through which we filter our specific data set by sensor types, that is either through Landsat uh, 5, Landsat 8, as well as the Sentinel series. So these buckets, the custom S3 buckets, are recreated in a region closer to us, closer to Bangalore, that is in Mumbai. So this has uh, two advantages. One is that in terms of costs, it helps us to monitor that, as well as the transpose fees are also uh, good. In the automated pipelines are also created uh, to enable the data sets to be indexed directly into the data cube from the S3, S3 buckets, as well as also a RDS instance, that is a database under AWS, is also used to index uh, the data sets from the open data queue that enables faster load time and indexing speeds. In the second set, we see a data indexing and user services uh, part. This is where we have a parallelized and multiple nodes are used to sort of index uh, tiles directly from S3 uh, onto RDS. Uh, this allows uh, an advantage of multiple ODC instances uh, that can be pulled up quickly. And then they also use a common database. Uh, this is directly linked to all of the user services using Python or R APIs, as well as a Jupyter Notebook, Lab, and Terminals that allow multiple users to log in and run their custom scripts. Fourth topic here is about the containerization of applications. So here, uh, the two services that we use, Data Cube Index and the Data Cube User Services, uh, these are completely containerized on Docker. Regarding the challenges and roadblocks under Work Package Zero. Uh, scalability has always been an issue since uh, large scale data sets uh, uh, comprising India level uh, will be quite difficult to manage in terms of cost and also the multiple services on the AWS that we'll be using. Uh, specifically, uh, the container services and the Kubernetes service, ECS and EKS, uh, might enable a more streamlined approach to this problem. Uh, that is where um, we would like to have some sort of uh, a training or a workshop in these specific services. Now, Krishna Kumar will talk about work packaging. 
the work package one focuses on generating the line over time series at 30 meter resolution using the data ingested in the data cube. The work package includes three main components. One, a machine learning model, which we try to identify the built-up cells at 30 meter resolution. Two, generate sub-pixel built-up and vegetation fraction map at 30 meter resolution. Three, a trained a machine learning model to predict other land cover classes at 30 meter resolution using the 2005-2006 national land cover data set from Indian Space Research Organization. Our first goal was to produce a built-up map at 30 meter resolution. To produce fractional land cover information, we used a CNN model, which is trying to predict the percentage of built-up and vegetation information within each 30 meter landsat cell. A hard classified disk for image for Bengaluru from 2011 is used for training, which is shown in figure B. These are the land cover maps for Bengaluru. Figure A shows the 30 meter land cover information, whereas figure B and figure C shows the fractional built-up and vegetation land cover for the same area. We have tested our model using Mumbai 2009 Landsat 5 TM data. The fractional built-up and vegetation land cover information for Mumbai is given in figure A and B. Now, Pratyush will talk more on this. While we are working on citywide analysis, we are also trying to generate large-scale land cover maps. In this process, we are trying to understand two main points. First, the computational requirements and challenges for large-scale CNN deployment. And second, to have a benchmark to evaluate our own models. For instance, we use the Joint Research Center's GHS S2Net model to generate 10 meters built-up prediction using Sentinel-2 data. For Karnataka itself, we found that there is a lot of over-prediction in built-up class. For now, we correct this using nighttime lights data. The main challenges of generating large-scale land cover data are, first, the lack of availability of large-scale data that captures the diversity of the study area, for instance, a country like India. And second, whatever reference data that we use for training is, has some amount of impurity in it. We have also developed Bayesian spatial desegregation models to generate 30 meter population surfaces using covariates such as building height data, fractional built-up, fractional vegetation, and land use dates. The fractional built-up and vegetation layer are already discussed in this presentation. And the building height data was generated using Cartosat 1 2.5 meter studio product. The residential layer was obtained from local planning authority and was corrected for basic errors, for instance, left out residential areas as identified on satellite image. Now I'll hand it over to Suraj to discuss the details of work package 2 and 3. Continuing to the results of uh, work package 2, we uh, took the covariates that were mentioned earlier and fit a Bayesian spatial disaggregation model to disaggregate the population of uh, two cities, Bangalore and Mumbai down to 30 meter grids. And for this, we use the probabilistic pro programming tool STAN running on a compute in intensive PCT. To scale it to the India level, we plan to use approximate inference tools like Mila. These maps show the utility of this type of uh, disaggregation. On the left-hand side, you see uh, administrative unit level polygons where the data is aggregated. And the right-hand side is the detailed disaggregated map showing the spatial variation in much more detail. And this is for the city of Bengaluru and for the city of Mumbai. We are also working on estimating population of uh, neighborhoods, treating the problem as a predictive uh, modeling situation. And we use convolutional neural networks to train on uh, small image chips, capturing the census enumeration blocks of the city of Bengaluru. And um, the current performance is shown on these graphs. Uh, the actual population versus the predicted population. And we can see that there is a good amount of uh, predictability. Now, moving on to the work package three, the intention here is to map development indicators to disaggregate them down to 30 meter cells. Going forward, we would like to extend this work to build a Bayesian spatio-temporal model to interpolate survey data like the NFHS. By the end of this year, our aim is to finalize all these methods across the different work packages and complete the land cover time series, population mapping, and the development indicator mapping, especially from the National Family Health Survey for the state of Karnataka. And by the end of the project, we expect to scale up all the methods to generate all these data for the entire India. Our expectation is that the project will generate really valuable outputs, which will be useful contribution towards achieving the UN SDGs and the Sendai framework and other climate agreements. Great, thank you very much uh, for that really interesting presentation. Uh, very uh, impressive, the amount of work that you're, you're accomplishing here. Um, let's go to uh, Joe. Joe's got your, you have your hand raised. 
Yep. Hey, uh, so this is super interesting. Thank you. And it's, in it's very interesting to see all of the different data sets you're using. Um, you mentioned that you, uh, you are copying them all over to the Mumbai region. Um, and that makes sense because the data is closer to you, right? But it also means that you need to pay for the storage of all that data that is already stored somewhere else, right? So I was wondering if you had tried or given thought to um, running your processing in, say, in Oregon, where the Landsat data, the Sentinel-2 data sits, um, the Veers data, the Nightlights data is sitting in the east coast of the US, right? But that's still, I mean, globally speaking, that's still close to Oregon. So have you thought of running all your processing in Oregon and then just sort of shipping back the derived right. product to, uh, to Mumbai where you might want to sort of do your visualizations and things, but that might keep you from having to duplicate the data storage. Uh, yeah, Joe, so uh, there are, uh, I don't know if it, is it, yeah, is it working? Yeah, I can hear you, you're good. Yep, yep you're good. Uh, so basically there were uh, a major issue that we face in terms of data is because of uh, legal issues that we have uh, at our institute here. So that sort of stops us from, you know, mm -hmm. putting or analyzing data in a region outside of India. And the only option that we were allowed to was sort of, you know, find data centers close to Bangalore and sort of work into sure. that. So uh, that is one of our first, uh, you know, setbacks in terms of, you know, costs and also transfer speed when it comes to uh, S3s and uh, all other services. Uh, and also uh, another point was that uh, we were filtering out by sensors onto S3s, uh, not only to, uh, you know, link to the ODC and this particular project uh, specifically, but also to other services. I mean, other projects that we're working on uh, individually outside of AWS. So it made sense to have a, a repository here closer to us that we can quickly just, you know, go and filter out a couple of tiles and just downloaded it for, you know, uh, for work here instead of going to the, uh, you know, NASA or USGS publishers and finding data there. So a couple of uh, challenges there that we had to sort of go through initially. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. And I, I obviously do not know uh, about your sort of legal requirements um, for data sovereignty. But one thing to consider if you ever feel like challenging anyone on this is that um, I think a lot of times these are overly broad because that data isn't your data to begin with, right? Um, it's not so, uh, and I, I, it gets wrapped up in these data sovereignty things, but it was never your data to begin with, right? It's coming from a different, a different country anyway. So uh, that's, you know, uh, I can't help you there, unfortunately. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. Great, thanks. Uh, any, uh, any other questions for the group? I had a question um, on the um, chart that you showed the predict predictability of the populations. I didn't quite catch uh, what kind of time frame you were looking at there. Was that a, a, a projection of, uh, of a year or a few years or what, uh, what was the time frame there? That was for one time period. This is 2011, which is when we had the last census. And that's for one city, uh, Bengaluru, which is where we are based. Uh, and that was really trying to predict at what we call the census enumeration block, a little bit like census block or census tracts in other countries. Um, and what you saw was the scatter plot showing the actual and the predicted uh, population figures that still work in somewhat early stages. Um, so something we hope to develop in the coming months. It, it looked uh, it looked like there was a fairly close. Uh... Uh, correlation between you know the prediction and the actual population change. Um, do you have any ideas on on how to improve uh, the prediction? So the the current model, which uh, this, it was the scatter plot, which we are looking at, that's like I said, so for single time period. And uh, currently, what we are considering is of adding other ancillary data sets like. Uh, uh, building height, which we are anyway using in our statistical model. We are trying to see if incorporating that directly into the deep learning framework will improve the accuracy. Apart from that, also land use, because that helps distinguish between what is residential and what is non-residential and so on. Ideally, we would want to have one model which can directly go from high resolution image to population numbers, but that seems somewhat difficult at least as of now. 
Great. Um, and, and just one final thought too. Um, again, um, you know, I know I realize that you're spinning the project up still and you have to, you have, uh, you know, you have a ways to go, but when you get to a point where you feel fairly confident of some of your results, you might want to compare with um, a, the uh, Global Human Settlement uh, Initiative in GEO, uh, which is um, principally the JRC, the Joint Research um, uh, Center of the European Commission. You know, they, they are also doing population estimates of uh, major cities around the world. So, you know, might be, might, maybe you're already aware of them, I'm not sure, but it might be good to just kind of compare, compare how, you, how your results are with what they're, they're doing. Yes, that's right. We are aware of them. And in fact, we are using them as a benchmark for the work which we are doing. So for Great. instance, uh, as we mentioned briefly in the video for uh, the CNN based land cover mapping work, we are already using their CNNs because they recently released a whole bunch of models for all around the world to map land cover, especially built up at 10 meter resolution. So we are using that as a benchmark to evaluate our own models. Great. Very good. Well, thanks again for uh, that Im impressive amount of work, and we'll look forward to uh, seeing the, the progress that you make in the next year, year and a half. All right. Thanks. All right. Let's um, go ahead and move on now to our um, fourth presentation. <clears throat> this is going to be brought uh, to us by um, by uh, the uh, National Institute of Geography and Statistics, INEGI, in Mexico. Uh, Jimena Juarez is the uh, lead for this project, and um, it's called Earth Observations for Sustainable Development. And uh, supporting her is uh, Michael Schmidt, who is uh, with, uh, affiliated with CONABIO, which is the National Commission for the Knowledge and Use of Biodiversity in Mexico City. He is the uh, project lead for uh, for this particular project. So uh, let's now have a look at their um, video presentation. Hello, everyone who is attending this webinar for the Earth Observation Cloud Credits Program of GEO and AWS. My name is Jimena Juarez, and I work in the National Institute of Statistics and Geography of Mexico. I am most honored to present to you the project Earth Observation for Sustainable Development, and I am in the company of my friends Michael, Everardo, Julian, Mariana, Ixchel, Edith, and Omar from CONAVIO, the National Commission for the Knowledge and Use of Biodiversity in Mexico. Rather than stating the problem, the quote on the screen is here to help us to properly dimension the problem. Ecological degradation and the rapid loss of habitats and species challenge our very existence. Defaunation is one of the most neglected aspects of ecosystem degradation due to the difficulty of its measurement and study. In order to build a truly integral biodiversity indicator, we propose to fuse satellite third observations in the form of land use and land cover maps and in-situ sensor data mainly camera traps and sound recorders on over 400 sites in Mexico. However, additional photos, videos, and sounds have been collected in over 3,000 sites from the period of 2014 to 2018. We call this integration the Ecosystem Integrity Index, which we believe should be on equal footing with the GDP. We also envision that stakeholders and policymakers will be able to visually grasp the repercussions of ecosystem degradation processes like deforestation with a special data cube based tool. This solution is divided into three work packages. The first work package to detect and classify fauna. A second work package to process satellite images in order to produce land cover and land cover change maps. And the third and final work package to produce the tool that will allow the visualization of these changes in the territory. In this slide, we can see some of the results for work package one, specifically those that focus in the use of deep learning to detect and classify Mexican bats based on ultrasound data. The graphic shows us the detection rate for different species. 
The first objective of this part of the project was to develop models for detection, segmentation, and classification of bad calls. A secondary objective was to test different architectural traits for regularization of convolutional layers. We use fully convolutional neural network as a backbone for all models, and all experiments were performed in parallel using Amazon SageMaker platform and single MLP3 2x large instances. And thanks to its fully convolutional properties, our detection model can also yield explicit time frequency segmentations over spectrograms from which binary masks and bounding boxes can be produced. We found that test results for different versions of channel dropout within classification show that uniform dropout is the best regularization approach for our case. Classification results are still preliminary but very promising, considering that the taxonomic range of over 90 species constitutes the largest classification attempt for bad calls up to the moment, to our best knowledge. Additionally, we have been able to observe that confusion matrices built for alternative grouping schemes show that useful ecological information can be obtained even when species level classification is not possible. With this slide, we jump to the results of work package one that focus on the use of camera trap videos for the detection and classification of fauna. As most of the video data do not contain animals due to the camera being triggered by wind-induced movement of branches, we start by answering the basic question. Is anything of interest contained in the video? And if the answer is yes, we then proceed to find out what it is. All videos were processed frame by frame as images establishing bounding boxes like the ones you can see on your screen with the meta detector model. Within each box, the detected object is classified as species, genus, or family. The most frequent label amongst all frames was then assigned to the respective video. Additionally, for the ensemble model, coordinates are used as an input to describe potential occurrence of each species to the model. Both models classify 49 species, but the level of classification is defined by the uncertainty. Results below a certain threshold get classified as genes. A lower threshold is used for family, and for results below a third and even lower threshold were not classified at all. Here you can see the results for the species level classification. This next slide shows the results for genus level classification. And in this slide, you can see the results for family level classification. We currently do not consider the occurrence of more than one species and or individual per video, but this will be our next step. Moving on to the status update of work package two which regards satellite data processing for land cover and land cover change maps for five states. The slide that you are looking at right now shows results for the state of Veracruz as an example. For this task, a crowd mapping platform has been provided to receive rapid feedback from the users on the products. It's also worth mentioning that based on the original matrix classification scheme of 31 classes, we could discern four additional land covers and 15 crop types at satisfactory accuracy levels of 75%. And finally, this next slide addresses the status update for Work Package 3, a public mobile and web-enabled tool for the visualization of changes in the territory over time. So far, the whole Landsat archive for the national territory has been fed to INEGI's Institutional Open Data Cube instance, which implies around 90 terabytes of data. Regarding the content to be displayed in this app, with this massive data array, 30 annual summary mosaics were generated. These products are called geomedians, and their total volume is around one terabyte. Additionally, an internal image review process was launched to have the data and tool compliant with regulation. Today, 
The public visualizer, together with the corresponding documentation and tutorials, can already be found in the link shown in the screen. In this example animation, we are looking at the change over time in cities like Aguascalientes or Cancun from the year 2000 to the year 2018. Regarding challenges and roadblocks, we have not received feedback regarding Sentinel Hub credits requested, as we are unaware if these credits will be assigned through an AWS account and what are the terms and conditions involved. Maybe they did send communication, but it did not reach me, Jimena Juarez. It is also worth repeating that for INEGI, it is not possible to receive the credits on an institutional account due to concern raised by our legal department. So an internal agreement was reached for Conavio to receive and manage the credits. Regarding next steps and expected impact for our project, in 2021, we will continue to expand the data platform to host a suit of products like land cover change and land cover. We are currently in talks with other federal agencies to provide visualization of other data sets like the national forest and groundwater inventories, which will be presented in a special format. We will continue training models for audio and video processing and we will engage with our Colombian colleagues and process the data provided by them. Then we expect to have an efficient processing pipeline running by mid 2021, which will allow rapid processing of our and also third party audio and camera track video data. Finally, we wanna share our experiences with other countries from the region who may have similar needs. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Jimena and uh, and Michael. That was a really really interesting presentation. Um, do we have uh, any questions? Uh, let's see. Um, so the Sentinel Hub um, issue, we can certainly work on. I see here that um, that Joe has offered to help you with that. So. Unfortunately, I don't think uh, we were aware that that was an issue. So we'll we'll definitely work towards uh, helping you uh, resolve that. Um, any um, any other uh, questions or comments on this presentation? I just um, I, I had a, a, a question. Um, I noted you said that you're you are keeping track of 49 species, is that is that correct? Is there any particular, um, any particular uh, um, methodology behind those 49 species? I mean, why, why 49 and not uh, 52 or, you know, what, what was the reason that you chose those, that particular uh, group? Uh, yeah, I'm going to answer that. Okay, fine. Uh, yeah, that's because, um, that's the data level that level data that we have we are restrained because okay. of lack of data okay. but we we want to to uh, 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 increase this uh, species number yeah sure okay great usually a question of training data yes yeah we're collecting training data and that's a restraining factor is it is it that the data is not there, or the data is there but you can't access it? The data is there, but it has to be organized, and uh, especially in detection in, in photo trapping, you need lots of different angles because the the photo traps in the field capture all kinds of different variations in illumination angles, the uh, animal from behind, from the side. So you have to collect really a, a good training database to detect different species. It depends also on the species and the genus. For example, cats are easier than uh, other species because you have the eyes in front of you and you, then you can basically use that and the different geometries of the face, uh, pretty much like a human. In other species, it's much more difficult when they have the eyes on the side, like herbivores usually. So that's usually the training factor. And we also have uh, species, for example, uh, where we only have one or two images and uh, one uh, goal for processing videos was also to increase 
this amount of uh, data for training. Yeah. But anyways, the interesting thing here is we're pretty hopeful that we can build these pipelines. There is huge amounts of photo trapping data around. Uh, we know of many sites in Mexico which have been doing photo trappings and usually they produce ten, tens of thousands of images because of wind movement and everything which triggers the camera but doesn't contain any animal. So the first thing really would be to sifting through the enormous archive and in finding if an image contains something. That's the first question. And then when, it, when we have found that, we can focus on these images and can also display the difficult ones in a, in a crowd mapping uh, uh, initiative and have people label them. And the more we get labels, the more we can train the, the processing. Well, it's a very interesting project. Um, and it, it looks as though, I mean, I was glad to hear that you are um, communicating with uh, Colombia, where you've been in touch with Rafael, I suppose. And uh, because it yeah. looks like there's some nice complementarity between his project and, and yours. So um, very good. OK, um, then if there are no further questions, um, we'll go ahead and have a look at our final uh, project for today. <clears throat> Let me. Uh, bring that up. Apologies here. I was, uh, I was uh, paying so close attention that I forgot to queue up the next, uh, the next one here. <laughs> so our next project is brought to, uh, to us by um, Natalia uh, Kusul, who is a professor at the uh, Space Research Institute of the National Academy of Sciences of Ukraine, and also from the State Space Agency of Ukraine in Kiev. And uh, her project is about <clears throat> generating global products uh, with core spatial resolution data on the base of higher spatial resolution data, which would be better suited for regional products and applications and particular indicators such as 2.4.1, 11.3.1, 15.1.1, .1, 1, and 15.3.1. So uh, without uh, further delay, let's um, listen to uh, Natalia's uh, presentation. for the Geo Amazon Cloud credit program with the project of Sustainable Development Goals Assessment. We work with uh, Sustainable Development Goals indicators for several years, and now we have an opportunity to create operational service, cloud-based service for assessment of such kind of indicators. Many indicators are uh, based or intensively used information on land cover and land use change. And our team has an experience uh, in uh, these indicators and in this methods, methodology. So uh, we try to implement it into a cloud-based technology within our project. And my colleagues will uh, tell about the project goals, our team, our findings and uh, our changes which we have with this project. Thank you. Hello, I'm everybody. I would like to present Space Research Institute, which is created and supported by National Academy of Science of Ukraine and State Space Agency of Ukraine. Our institute is the main organization which is responsible for satellite imagery usage and country level. During more than 10 years, we provide satellite and geospatial data and services for different governmental and international organizations. We are the members of GCOM and GeoGlam programs of GEO community members of Committee of Earth Observation Satellite Stewards. And uh, our institute hosts UN the Regional Support Office and collaborates with Joint Research Center of European Commission and United Nations Development Program. Space Research Institute participates and plays key role in different international and national projects at the moment. Our mission is to facilitate digitalization of Ukrainian economies through green satellite monitoring and decision making in Ukraine. For the next five years, we plan to increase reliability and sustainability of our technical solutions and continue data and service provision at higher level. And 
another one for the Bayer Organization is the Physical Technical Institute of National Technical University of Ukraine, Kyiv Polytechnic Institute. We are actively involved for PhD and to master students in the project activities. The humanity faces with the global environmental problem like global warming, climate change, desertification. All these factors fail into the food security and economy well-being for many countries. Here is effective combat with such dangers can be done without efficient strategy that take into account measurement of problem state. Thus, these measurements named SDG indicators should be monitored for each country in the best way. In our project, we propose informational technology for four SDG indicators assessment and its implementation in the AWS cloud environment based on open data grid technology with including deep learning algorithm for land cover classification, with physical modeling, weather modeling and satellite data analysis, and scaling of this technology for three countries, Ukraine, Argentina, and India. By this year, we set up Sentinel-1 data processing workflow in the AWS virtual machines and ingested this data into the Ukrainian data cube. In total, we processed more than 13 terabytes of satellite data for Ukraine. For crop type and land cover classification, optical Landsat and Copernicus Sentinel-2 data were used. For this satellite data, the compositing procedure for specific time series generation has been created. The classification procedures have been created with based on a deep learning approach for land cover mapping, in particular an ensemble of neural network and uh, long short-term memory neural network. The overall accuracy of classification map for Blue Ukraine is 91% with high F1 scores for major crops, uh, cereal, seed, sunflower, and maize. To conduct SDG 11.3.1 calculation for Ukraine, we created the functional urban area layer component to the Copernicus Urban Atlas products. Using Lincaro maps for 2016 and 2019 with 10 meters special resolution, we populated built-up area chain for Ukraine cities, and with use of NASA gridded population of the world product, we obtained this indicator on the city and county scale. The preliminary land degradation map of all Ukraine with special resolution 13 meters was created based on trend analysis of vegetation index of Landsat 8 satellite data in the Ukrainian data cube. This product is the basis for the SDG 2.4.1 and 15.3.1 indicators calculation, and in this process, its creation is the most time consuming task. During our work, we had these challenges and roadblocks. First one is injection of Sentinel 1 data into data cube. The second one is time series composite generation for land cover crop type classification for our deep learning algorithm. The third is the need for usage of advanced technique of multiprocessing and clustering for large-scale area processing. And the last one is in-situ data collection during the lockdown period for the crop type mapping. We expect by the end of 2021 to obtain the scale of the entire classification technology and finalize as you do the calculation workflow. As a result of the project, we will improve the existing workflows for SDG indicator assessment by the use of high special resolution data and filling gaps between existing global products and national ones. All right, thank you very much, uh, Natalia and, and crew. Uh, that's a very, very interesting presentation on uh, how you're making use of uh, data cube technology for the Ukraine, and in particular for uh, some of the SDGs, uh, as, as you mentioned. Um, do we have any questions for, uh, for the group? Joe, uh, go ahead. Yeah, so you mentioned you had issues with the Sentinel-1 data ingestion. I was just interested to know what those issues were. Uh, well, we started injection, um, 
injection uh, of Sentinel-1 uh, before uh, the script for this injection was uh, already uh, available or worked on. Uh, and we had to uh, combine it with, uh, the, with our processing chain for Sentinel-1 data. Okay, so it wasn't necessarily a problem with the data. It was more to do with the scripts for yeah, it was the, more okay. uh, with the script and the ejection of this like custom data in the data. Sure. Great, thank you. Okay, thanks. Uh, any other questions, uh, comments? <clears throat> Is um, maybe just a quick question. The so if if I understand correctly, the end. Um, the end game here is to produce a tool that will allow you to uh, assess uh, progress towards these particular SDG um, SDG in indicators that you've mentioned. Is that is that right? That'll be something that can be used on an operational basis for the Ukraine. Yes, yes. Uh, it will be a tool that can be uh, used in Ukraine and can be uh, transferred to other countries. So, so we are not uh, going to focus on a specific territory, we are focused on the technologies that can be transferred and, uh, and can uh, be applied for any type of territory, small territories, large scale territories. Okay, that's very, that's very interesting. Um, you know, in, in connection with 15.3.1, um, you may be aware of um, um, a data platform or a data analysis platform called trends.earth. Um, or, or may, maybe you're not. I'll put it. I'll put it in the chat window. Um, it might be good just to uh, have a look at. Um, you know, one, again, once you've um, established uh, your, your data platform, uh, it might be good to do, compare with uh, what Trends.Earth um, is uh, producing because they are. Um, they are fairly uh, closely involved in our geo land degradation neutrality initiative, and they're they're kind of the go-to platform right now for helping countries assess land degradation. Um, so, if you're developing a tool, it would be great to know um, know about that and and uh, possibly include that as uh, as a, a tool for anybody to use. Mm -hmm. um, Yes, okay. of course. Uh, we know Trans Earth. It's really a great plugin for quantum geese. It works based on the Google Earth engine. Yep. Uh, it is produced uh, uh, 300 meters uh, land degradation maps. But the idea of our project is um, is implementation of our um, of our technologies that can provide field level statistics on the land degradation because uh, course resolution data are really great on the country or region scale. But in Ukraine, as we are a large agriculture uh, country, uh, we are interested in the field level and find uh, areas and uh, fields with uh, land degradation. So um, when you say field level, do you mean like, is it 10, 10 meter resolution or? Um... Uh, 10, 30 meters resolution. Yeah, okay, great. Okay, um, well, if there are no further questions, uh, we're, uh, time is ticking away here. So let's, um, maybe now what I'd like to do is turn over to Joe and Anna. You've, you've heard uh, all five of the uh, presentations and some of the difficulties uh, or challenges that uh, the projects are encountering. Uh, have you got any uh, any uh, thoughts on uh, on on the way forward, or just what are your impressions here? Yeah, so uh, it was very good to see all of these. Um, thank you very much for sharing them. Uh, there's three things I wanted to sort of um, uh, bring up real quick, and I'll paste links here in the side as well. Um, so the first one for those of you doing sort of large scale geospatial processing. Um, rather than sort of doing processing as, as like a new satellite image or something comes in, right? But you're doing sort of bulk reprocessing. Um, something called the spot market might be of interest to you. Um, and so if you're not familiar with it, basically it's the way that AWS auctions off unused compute resources. And so whereas the normal on-demand price might be, you know, X, you can say, I only want this resource uh, if it comes to half of that price or 70% off, right? You can sort of name your price. Um, and then when uh, we have extra capacity, we will give you that compute resource, right? 
And so this means that if you're doing large scale processing that doesn't necessarily have a very tight timeline requirement, um, if you can take several days or several weeks to do it, you can get the resources at a, a very reduced price, right? Something like 70 to 90% uh, price reduction. Um, and so that might be something that you would want to look at uh, for those of you doing large scale bulk reprocessing that doesn't have a super tight timeline. Um, the other thing is a number of you mentioned different data sets um, like the Landsat data, the Sentinel data, the Nightlights data. Um, for those of you who don't know about it, please check out the Registry of Open Data on AWS. Uh, there you will find all of the data sets that are publicly available uh, on AWS. And so you'll see those data sets listed there, but then a lot of other geospatial data or other types of data that might be interesting for you to, to use in your pipelines. Um, and then the final thing I will say is um, we have a ton of training available. So if you're looking to use any new services, any new features, um, or just want to know how to better use the service you're already using, uh, please check out the training. Um, I believe there are some paid options there, but there's a whole lot of free uh, options as well. So there's, there's sort of real meaningful free training content that you can have access to. Um, other than that, I would just say it was very, very interesting to see all of the presentations and see some of the similarities and the differences between what you're doing. So uh, thank you, thank you very much. Great, and I will add to that. Um, so yeah, thank you uh, as well for making the time and putting the effort in putting these presentations together. Uh, it's actually really rewarding to see the kind of work that you guys are doing with, with these credits and with the data. Um, uh, it seems like really impactful and, and the amount of work has been done is really impressive as well. Um, I wanted to just mention a couple of things. One of them is that it seems like some of you have been stuck um, and found some roadblocks and, uh, and we weren't aware of it. And so I really wanted to encourage you if you come across any roadblock to please reach out to us. It might be that we cannot, be the, we might not be the right people to solve that, but we'll certainly can advise and, and, and try to guide you to other people if, if that's the case. Um, so please do reach out to us. Uh, when you have a problem and don't wait for a situation like this because you obviously would be wasting a lot of time. Um, the other thing is that uh, in the conversations with the previous groups, um, they, it came to the surface that there might be an interest in having more regular connection with the community and an opportunity not only to share your work, but share lessons learned and expose some of the problems you might have and have more of a sense of community as we move forward. Um, so we were talking about possibly revamping the forum and, and discuss other opportunities even for training and bringing the group together. So just keep an eye for that. Um, yeah, but apart from that, I, I think the, the last thing I would say is that some of the work you guys are doing, uh, I can envision would potentially have a longer life than the, the life of the credits. So, um, and, and I think Doug had suggested that, but it might be a good idea for us to sit down at some point and understand how to think of a more sustainable path forward uh, post credit. Um, that's it, thank you very much. Okay, great, thanks, uh, thanks Joe, thanks Anna. Um, any, uh, any comments from, from any of the group uh, in response to what you've seen or what we've discussed today? Hey, I'd like to thank our colleagues from, from Amazon for uh, helping us when we had these roadblocks. We did reach out when we had some, some issues and they have been very helpful. So uh, just to encourage everybody else that has any problem to contact them, they are very helpful uh, for this. And, and, and that offer that was made in the end because to make, uh, th yes, so these projects are, we are supposed, we are thinking about continuing our work and the use uh, that we're doing to the credits after the grant is over. And if it's any possibilities to, to have that uh, kind of resources for us, you will be very interested. We are very interested in that. And of course, continue engaging with you, not only to receive credits, but also to provide feedback and, and replicate and uh, give more uh, information and these kind of activities about our work uh, in the future, of course. Yeah, thanks, Rafael. I think I think what we'll we'll you know we'll, what we'll do is is maybe uh, towards the end of of the three year period, we're we're roughly just past the halfway point. 
So we may we we may just have another one of these uh, webinars at the end of the of the the project uh, of the life cycle, where we discuss you know where do we go from here um, and try to to think of uh, you know brainstorm on some some solutions and Joe and Anna of course uh, will be part of that and and can offer some some ideas, um, but um, yeah that's something uh, we're we're definitely interested in doing. Uh, Michael. Yeah, I'm, I wanted to follow up on, on Anna's uh, suggestion. That, that's really interesting. Um, maybe you guys at Amazon could think about a service uh, quite similar to EO data hosting for camera traps and audio data. There's lots of data around and uh, it's rather dispersed. And it would be absolutely great to have it hosted on a, on a, on a single in a single entity where you can access it and where we may even contribute in processing that data. It, it would help a lot in understanding two different issues. One is deformation, the loss of species in or the loss of animals in, in ecosystems. That's a, a separate problem we can't assist with the satellite data because we simply don't see through the canopy. And you can't even with radar data detect, uh, detect, of course, the presence of big or small animals. The other one would be the constant invasion by uh, cattle and other uh, domestic animals and feral animals, which which really have an extremely devastating effect on the ecosystems. It's a major degradation factor and be completely underestimated. So the especially audio data would capture presence of cows quite easily, as it's a very specific sound they do. Also, also goats. That's another big problem. So that could be a really cool service if we had something like that, where you can simply upload the data and have it processed and get then point data on the presence of these species. Yeah, thank you, Michael. I just uh, I placed my email address in the in the chat. Uh, if you don't mind just following up, we can discuss that further and uh, figure out what might be Absolutely. a good way to engage. Thank you. Cool. Thanks. Um, Krishna, I you you and your group. Uh, I'm just have a, 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 a kind of a general question. How how do you feel that you have benefited from uh, from this program? Do you is there um, any, uh, you know, we've talked about some of the difficulties. Uh, let's talk about the other side. How have you benefited from uh, from this uh, program? Yes, so we've benefited tremendously because this is really kickstarted as uh, Anna mentioned earlier. Uh, I think a much longer term project, which uh, we've initiated as a result of this uh, cloud credits grant. And in some senses, from our perspective, you know, we have, people with expertise in the methods. The data has largely been available for a while. It was really the computational resource which was limiting us from carrying forward some of these ideas. And the Cloud Credits grant has really enabled all of that to uh, start. And uh, in fact, we're in the process of trying to raise alternate funding to continue this project beyond the uh, AWS uh, grant time period itself. Okay, great, that's good to hear. <laughs> Um, yeah. Um, can I go? Yes, please. Um, go ahead. Well, w w with our project, with the exception of the the uh, bottlenecks we had, we because with the with the opportunity that comes with using the um, um, AWS platform to process um, big data, could have helped us in trying to um, identify all these areas that are being converted into illegal mining. In our case from farming, cash, cash crop farming into um, illegal mining, it, it would have helped us a lot. But uh, nevertheless, we are still about to progress. So I think the benefit will come when we cross this head off. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Kenneth. Yes, I'm, I'm sure that, um, you know, you have to uh, you have to walk before you can run. So uh, I think uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you're, you you yeah. are now at a good at a good trot. So uh, we'll look forward to the progress that you make uh, in the next uh, in the coming months. Um, real quickly, um, let's see, uh, Leonid or Andri or Hanna, do you any any thoughts? Uh, final thoughts on benefits that you've enjoyed from uh, the program? Uh, well, I think the main uh, benefit that we obtain uh, by this program, program is possibility to um, 
to come fr came from the uh, methodology described and use it once to the operational tools and can be shared and then can be used in operational mode and uh, it's a really great opportunity to um, to um, uh, to use uh, our research in the action great Okay, thanks. Um, maybe Jimena, I'll give you the last word. Uh, anything you would like to uh, to say? Thank you, Douglas. Um, the, this project has helped us in in Mexico to realize most of our difficulties to uh, run a project on the cloud. We've also been able to engage with other state units and understand how um, uh, understand the issue of compatibility of the data what they produce and what we need um, sometimes it's not um, it's not uh, the same thing and there is a um, uh, in between process that we need to to run so it's also a good uh, example of how uh, communication is key to perform a, a better use of information and the production. So understanding your role and the role of the one that is uh, just uh, uh, after you, so the one that is going to use your output as an input is very important and this has helped us a lot to, to, to grasp that concept. Very good. All right, well, uh, the, we're at the uh, end of our time. So I want to thank each and every one of you again for your uh, contribution. Thank you for uh, your uh, videos and your um, presentations. It's all been very interesting. What we're going to do is uh, we're going to find a way to make all of these, uh, every, every day has been recorded. Uh, so we're going to find a way to make those available for everyone who wants to uh, go back and revisit the the presentations or the the, the entire video if you like um, so just be watching your uh, email boxes uh, in the coming days for that so um, i think we'll call it uh, an end so thanks once again very much and uh, have a good rest of the day wherever you are thank you thanks thanks a lot. thank you everyone bye gracias bye gracias ciao ciao Gracias, hasta luego.